It's been a great three days, and I was fortunate enough with my wife, Kika, uh, to participate in a field trip on Tuesday where we went to the Copper Thorns and the Sebald's Ranches. Um, and I'd like to start there uh, and kind of give you a synopsis of two pages of what I've taken away from the past two and a half days. Uh, I think uh, it's pretty simple. When you're a cattleman and you look at the cattle, and you look at the body score, you look at the conformity, and you look at the health of the pastures, um, that says it all. If you're doing that, uh, you're doing that because you're doing something right, and you're doing something right because you know how to manage. Um, you know how to manage, you're at a certain level of excellence in management, and it takes decades to build a herd like they built, the copper thorns, and there's, there's just no way you can do that if you're not taking care of your grasslands and your rangelands. That's just in a story. Um, I would go on to the, by the way, the pancakes were, were great. I'd already eaten breakfast, but I went ahead and ate, ate three more. I've gained four pounds since I've been here. Uh, the Sabals, Dave, and his family, it's pretty simple. Uh, they've doubled their production, their beef production, on the same ground over 40 years. And if you look at the health of the cattle, once again, the health of the, of the rangeland, uh, they're doing a spectacular job. The land is in good hands with these people. And they've been doing this long before sustainability was cool. So it didn't just start doing this five years ago. What we saw there was Efficiency 101. Uh, they, they're managing their animal health, reproduction, genetics, forage management, intensification, because that's what you have to do as a rancher to survive. We don't have to classify that as sustainability. But they're also doing other services to the environment, uh, for the environment, for society. And I think what I really like is the honesty that um, producers accept the challenge to produce under a new set of guidelines and rules. There, there's a certain cutting edge of, the, of us that uh, would like to get better. And we also know that we've done a horrible job telling our story, well, because we're just too busy working. Producers produce. And that translates into Portuguese, fazendero, fazendo. Fazendero means fazer, that's the verb, infinitive, to do. It's funny how it translates across cultures. So, there's a bad perception about beef. Um, this, this resonated every day. Um, the, the industry itself is responsible for getting by behind the power curve. Uh, it got lazy. And now, the result is beef is negative, about climate, environment, and diet. The trust has been broken, if there is any trust. And all the while, eco-labeling is skyrocketing. And so it's grown what I think Dr. Hughes said, 62 percent, something like that. At the same time, there's food fraud in, in, involved in that, because there's no way you can grow that big and do what they're saying in such a short time. The supply chain, the supply chain doesn't accept this right now. Consumers the whole time, they're not satisfied. They keep screaming, free this, free that, but they don't want to pay for it. They want it, but they don't want to pay for it. They don't want to, they don't want to buy a problem, they want a solution. It's, everything's instant. Ranching beef production is not instant. The companies, we heard this, and I don't blame them, because they become the target because that's the bottleneck. So if you want to make change and you want to do it through terrorism, you attack them. And you hit them hard. And then they react. And then what they want to do is certify their risk. They want a piece of paper that says they're clean so they can go back to work. And they have a fiduciary responsibility to their stockholders. They want to protect their brand. Information is part of the product, but the supply chain, once again, is not set up for sustainability to produce those numbers. It's not set up for it yet. It's going to take a while. Transparency, traceability, um, and I'd say this, and you know, this is not whining. I don't want handouts, um, but a farmer in the red can't take care of the green. It's just as simple as that. And the extra cost, this is not me, I heard this this week, the extra cost tied in with sustainability need to become visible. Now. It's pretty simple to put on a spreadsheet and know what our break-even is. 
and you start adding these additional costs on that, we can see them, and they, they come out red. So most people this week have said that there's no premium for sustainability. I, I tend to agree. I tend to agree. Uh, there's, no, there's no premium for that. And no one, the consumer, expects it from us. But then again, Dr. Dr. Mitchell, Leslie Mitchell said that, at least for the EU and China, that for animal welfare, consumers overwhelmingly will pay more for that one component of sustainability. So kind of in closing what I've heard, farmers are in vogue. Farmers are cool. Ranchers are cool. Um, but no one wants to pay us to do the extras. So as we advance on the sustainability role, I can say that it's a long road ahead, but at we least we can rest our laurels on the decades, generational work that's been done in the field by men and women who have dedicated their lives to living one thing, land rich and cash poor. Uh, that's reality. So, should we, or should they be doing this anyway like the consumer thinks? I don't know. Um, I will say this, that I want to reiterate this. Why is animal welfare, should you pay more for it? When that, it makes good sense for me to do that because there's less stress on the animal, I make more money. Why should I be given a bonus for intensifying when that, that it, I won't intensify if it's not going to increase my bottom line. I don't understand. Um, I don't understand. Um, now what I do understand is that opportunity cost to come through conservation, biodiversity, keeping forests standing on flat ground that if you clear it your land appreciates tenfold, that's opportunity cost. Or if you've got Texas, Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, Cedar, mesquite, juniper, whitebrush, sage has taken over the American West because we eliminated fire and we did a bad job grazing for the first century, 1870 through the mid-1900s. So to transform that land back into pasture, it's, it's a tremendous challenge. That's why no one does it. Uh, so those are the issues, I think, for me, that ultimately we really have to focus on. So I'd like to kind of make a comment. Um, I'll be a little bit exposed my weaknesses, but beef sustainability is so complicated and it's complex, it's virtually impossible to make a one-size-fits-all solution. And I, for one, am wholly unsuited to define the framework on how this should look like on paper worldwide. What I can do is to show you how we put theory into action through over a thousand committed Brazilian producers. And I hope their story can motivate the rest of the supply chain. So I'm going to take you on a little trip and tell you a little story. Every good story involves a woman. And every great story involves a Brazilian woman. <laughs> <laughs> so I found out that Sherry and I went to the same school, and that's where I met my wife, Kika, a ranch management program where uh, really, we're taught about natural resource management, really how to economically make land work and take care of it and be handed it when you're young and deliver it to the next generation when you're old and better condition that you had it, received it. So when I met Kika, um, she left and went back to Brazil. This is in 1993. And I said, man, there's something about that girl. She's kind of spicy. And so I went down to Brazil and went and proposed to her. And her dad looked at me and said, are you kidding me? Um, are you kidding me? I've been training her, she had five daughters, but she's going to manage all my ranches. You're going to take her to Texas? I said, yes, sir. And so he outsmarted me, and he stuck me in the suburban, and we drove from Londrina, Paraná, 1,500 kilometers up in the Amazon basin. I will never forget it. And we went through a horrific road, driving 20, 30 miles per hour. Pay attention to the, the detail. Sustainability, logistics, hauling cattle, um, there, there's a lot of hurdles. Uh, got up there, and we went to a little town called Rocky Creek, Hibero and Cascalera. Uh, and as we went through the town, we came through a, a little ditch in the forest, and down I saw some shadows and, in a creek. And I said, what the heck is that? And I looked, and 
my father-in-law said, hey, Angel, hey, Shivanchi. Those are Indians. Those are Shivanchi. And it was a man and a woman. She had something on her head, and he was carrying bow and arrow, and he had ochre red paint on. I said, my God, this is unbelievable. And he off they went. So we went on another 15 minutes or so, and uh, he, he stopped the, the vehicle and said, John, to the north, that's the Amazon. That's the Amazon. I could see the wall of forest in, through, a, through a fields of, of burnt, charred trees that were, you know, had been cleared and burned. Um, so went a little bit further, saw something black running the side. It was a black jaguar running away. I said, you know, this, to myself, I said, man, this place, is, like, this is what I want to do. So uh, long story short, went back, and every Sunday at 6 o'clock in the afternoon, my father-in-law would call me. And he called me and said, when are you going to move to Brazil and come manage this, you know, this ranch that we sold in, in the southern part of Brazil and bought four times the landmass in the Amazon? So I called Kika's, um, her mentor, her godfather from uh, Friends of the Family. His name's Andre. And he was a big outdoorsman like me. And he said, John, get an airplane, buy a raft, buy a two and a half horsepower outboard engine, throw it in the airplane, fly down here to Amazon is yours. You can fish rivers that have never been fished. Uh, it is a wild west. So I hung up the phone, thought for about a split second, picked it up and called my father-in-law and said, I'm in. So we flew, we flew down to Brazil uh, in 19, 20 years ago yesterday. It was a very chaotic landscape we went to. Um, that map from east to west is about 600 nautical miles. From south to north is about 500 nautical miles. Um, and our, I don't know if I have a laser here, but on the right bottom corner, one of those plumes of smoke is on our property. So it's a, it was a very chaotic frontier uh, landscape um, that it's no different than the American West. Um, Brazil takes a lot of heat, but they just caught with, they got caught with their pants down in the middle of their frontier development. Um, thank you. Their, their frontier development phase. Uh, they caught developing their interior, and I can tell you that that process is fleeting, and it flies by, and it can't be stopped until it's run out. Meriwether Lewis made a made a statement: "You might as well try to stop a moving, try to stop an avalanche, as try to stop a moving frontier." That was in 1810. So, landowners in this condition simply have to ride the wave and accept the status quo as there is no incentive to do otherwise. So the time that I first flew down there in 93, um, this is a, that's uh, the Amazon basin right there. That's the Shingu National Park. Uh, the legal Amazon's right here. This is the legal Amazon, but the Amazon forest, transition forest is right here. Um, so this is in 1990, roughly 93, 94, when I flew down there, and I flew I flew across here, and I landed right here, and we lived with no electricity, no telephone for years, um, shortwave radio. Um, it's a very cool lifestyle, very tough, but it, you know, it takes, takes tough people to live out there. So that's what it's like today. Um, it, it, it's, it's a wave. It's a wave. Um, so what I saw and what I've seen happen in that time frame Here's, our, here's one of our properties right here. We also have a property right here. This is the Shingu National Park. This map is current. This map actually shows what I see as a pilot. And not, not just me, all my friends that are pilots, everyone on the ground that lives there, here, is that there is a lot more going on. The degradation from fire as deforestations come, it's dried out the region, and fire is consuming a lot. So it's just, if you read back of American history, we had the same thing. Europe was the same way at one point, eons ago. Uh, so I want to say that Brazil has a right to develop their interior. And they have a law, and they're a sovereign nation, and they should be allowed to develop it. And they should have the help of the world to do it correctly. End of story. Because it will happen regardless. And that's not my opinion. That's a fact. When, this, when I first moved there, I called Andre to got it, you know, tricked me to go down there. I said, hey, Andre, this is chaos. What are we going to do? He said, forget about it, man. He said, it's going to go. And he was a division manager of the Botucana Ranch in the Pantanal. 
uh, which is a Rockefeller property, right down here. And he'd fly from Parana up there, crisscross Sao Paulo, Matagross to Sul as a carpet of forest. And he said, John, I flew the same thing, man. He goes, uh, enjoy it. Enjoy your bush pilot days now because it's going to go someday. And that's wisdom. It's not pie in the sky, it's wisdom. It's going to go faster than we think. So, I wish I could, uh, well, here we go. Um, this is uh, Cadencia. It's a town that wasn't even there when I moved there. Uh, a few 25 houses today. It's a city. It's got ADM, Cargill, traders. Everybody's there. It's got 60,000 people. It's, it's going to be at Decatur, Illinois. Uh, that land right here, today, this is today's prices in Brazil in an economic uh, kind of crisis right now. That's still worth thirteen to $1,500 an acre, an acre. And that, that, that produces soybeans that you plant in October, that you harvest in February, you come in and you plant corn on top of that. And then the corn seed or in the maize, you put in grass seed, you harvest the corn, and then the grass comes up, you're getting three crops a year. So they know how to be intensive there. Now, what is this stuff worth? A fifth. So, I realized that this thing was going to go, and our only hope, and our only solution to this chaos, which is not, this is a frontier, is that the very folks clearing the forest around me, the producer, were just like my Uncle Juan and Corpus Christi, it's just like the copper thorns here, we're part of the solution. And if we don't work with them and give them incentive, it's going to go, and we're going to have, we'll be all be to blame. So I understood that the, the, the people out here, I understood their passion their love for the land, and most importantly, that if we give them a chance, if we give them a chance, they can do a lot more with the right incentive. And they can produce, and produce well, and they can also deliver a lot more uh, services back to society for conservation and biodiversity. So, necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, what the heck are you gonna do? And so we created for all intents and purposes, a movement. Uh, basically, to spearhead the, the, the tip of the spear of Brazilian producers who wanted someone to create the space for them to do the right thing. Um, and Trailblaze, truly, a new food system. And that's why we're here at GRSP, to trailblaze a new food system, not the status quo. And we can recognize and reward those people who are doing above and beyond. I heard that repetitively the, the past few days. People that are doing above and beyond, we have to incentivize them. And Alianza is, uh, in Portuguese, Alianza Terra means land alliance. Land, uh, alliance, uh, Alianza means uh, wedding band in Portuguese. It's a commitment to the land for the long term. This is not something overnight. You need people manning the land for the long term to take care of it. Um, and we're, we're certainly not a project because our goal is our lifetime commitment. Um, soon after we launched, uh, some key climate change policy experts uh, gurus, I call them carbon cowboys now, um, they needed landowners on board uh, for their UN carbon, uh, UN driven carbon uh, initiative called RED, reducing emissions uh, through uh, avoided deforestation, forest degradation. degradation. So they, they enticed us with offers of real economic incentive to compensate for better management in forest protection and private property through carbon payments and certification. Um, so here was an incentive staring us in the face, and we got motivated. So we went to work. Uh, we put boots on the ground and built the producing right platform to meet their demands, a tool that, that um, consolidated social environmental data from across the landscape and transformed it into continual improvement into really a sustainability due diligence tool. We focused on hard numbers, not adjectives, that would put us on a trajectory for change. And we created a natural resource management plan per property. Put boots on the ground. Our people created a management plan. What's happening? Um, and with that management plan, sent out the producer, and he signed on to a plan of action. It goes into a system that's monitored. That it's monitored, and uh, this change, this this whole process is executed through an IT platform. It's online, where we gather field data. It goes into the platform, and then ultimately, it serves uh, uh, industry. Uh, the producer and the consumer at the same time. And it, it, on a property level basis, um, we can monitor these properties and ensure that their continual improvement is happening. It, it serves collectively uh, as a transparent tool uh, that people can trust. And it can be tweaked for any protocol or certification system. 
So once producers see their property, once they see it, and I've heard this this week, once they see it with a new lens and realize how they fit into an overall holistic landscape, they never go back. Uh, they get motivated. Um, they're proactive in this, um, in our case, and still a new sense of pride in them. Sense of pride, they wanted to prove to the world who they were, um, and they wanted to show it. So when you put your property up there and you show all your problems and what you're doing, uh, that, that means you're confident, that you're confident that you're going to fix them and you're confident society will respond and somehow benefit you. Um, so once again, producers know how to produce, they know how to work, um, but they don't know how to tell a story. And they don't know how to tell the consumer how they raise, where their food and fiber came from and how it was produced. And our platform serves as a, as a clearinghouse for that information, an efficient way to tell that story. So the producers, the most important thing is they trusted us. They rallied to the challenge and responded with action. And we created a space for them to do the right thing. And out of the chaos of the Amazon, I can tell you emerged an exciting vision for the future of food production. It's a paradigm shift in action. It's working. These numbers, I, I, you know, they are what they are. Uh, but today, it started on our ranch, if I was in Esperanza, which is Hope Ranch, um, wanting to start this initiative and wanting to be a leader who leads by example. We put ourselves up first. Um, and in 2014, it grew to 734. This year, we're already at 1,135 farms. <clears throat> we expanded to Mexico, Colombia, Paraguay, and Argentina. But I guess what I really want to show you is this. Uh, we know every dot has a management plan. Every dot has a plan of action. Every dot has a promise to the landowner. We will fight for you to tell the story. We're not going to promise you anything. We will fight for you to tell the story. But right here, out of that 10.5 million acres roughly today, half is productive land, producing beef, producing soybeans, cotton, corn, coffee, uh, you name it, and producing it well for the most part. Uh, half of our land is forest, almost 5 million acres. Um, of that, I can tell you that 58,000 is degraded riparian zone that they let regenerate naturally or planted, in some cases, saplings. But that, that's not, th this isn't hot air. But you can see it on the internet. Uh, at, at present, there's 25,000 acres that is uh, under uh, regeneration right now. It's been fenced off. So this, these are the types of numbers we want to be able to go to the supply chain and say, we, you can tell this to your, to your, your customers. Um, a, as an institution, we have reduced fire by 85%. And the fire, you can tell, is consuming uh, a lot of the standing forest in the Amazon basin. Um, that's, that was the Uni Federal University of Minas Gerais that did a study on our, on our uh, our plan because we create fire plans on every property. And then we, we launched our own firefighting unit to put fires up on their properties. They were trained by the smoke jumpers from Idaho. Um, we've reduced illegal deforestation 98%. Uh, once they came in the platform, they made a commitment, so they don't, they don't want to go break the law. And 98% adoption of conservation tillage, no-till. Um, and I, what a number I like the best is on private lands, we're maintaining more forests in Yellowstone and Yosemite National Park combined. In private hands, well taken care of, with no cost to society right now. So with that being said, here's some things that are some examples. Erosion before and after, planting uh, uh, mudas or saplings in the riparian zone, uh, fencing off an area that's actually been regenerated back to the forest reserve. That's why it's so small. It'll grow up 60, 70 feet. Um, soybeans with the road here to keep the spray from drifting and also to prevent fire if it goes back in the pasture. Um, that's, uh, that, that, that is opportunity cost right there. Keeping forests like that on flat ground is a huge, huge effort. Uh, fuel storage before and after, they didn't have a retention. I mean, that's better than anything I had growing up. Uh, but nevertheless, they had to go do this to come into compliance with the Brazilian law, which is very rigorous. Uh, as I said, we created our own firefighting unit. We also have trained over 10 Indian tribes as uh, wildland firefighters. So normally, cowboys and Indians are antagonists in this case. We are fighting a common enemy fire. Um, so this is a big number. Um, what we asked the, the men and women in the field to do, they did 70%. And that we, we calculated it. We they give it field visits, monitoring, and, and also um, the, the producer you know, sending information to us. That relates to about 70 million reais for 22 million, 22 million bucks that has been invested directly in land, wouldn't have been direct invested before. Wouldn't happen. But here's the big number. 
This photo in that forest, that Yellowstone and Yosemite, has an opportunity to cost in today's market of $5 billion. $5 billion of forest on flat ground that people in London don't have to keep, people in Texas don't have to keep. Um, so if we have an even playing field, we need to pay attention to that. So the, this is the, the kicker. Um, producers have a higher bar in sustainability than the marketing departments do. If we deliver a clear and concise message to the producer, they'll lead the paradigm shift. We're in a paradigm shift. They'll lead it. They're going to deliver huge results in Canada, United States, Australia, Brazil. It doesn't matter because we think alike. And it's just, I want to make sure I get this across. They'll deliver huge results, but this will demand commitment from everyone else in the supply chain over the long haul to bring real economic value back to the soil. That is what producing right is all about, taking care of the land and its people. Action over adjectives. Sustainability to us is just that simple. It's just that simple. So I think, I know, that GRSB has the opportunity to transform the sustainability debate into action by deploying the clout in this room of its supply chain partners in concerted effort to construct a modern food system. What we do in beef will reflect to everything else because certification in soybeans, all the other certification systems haven't delivered the real incentive back to the ground. So we have the opportunity to focus on one thing, two things actually, quality and fairness, whereby beef quality is not only defined by the product itself, but also by the social and environmental investments made back at the ranch. Anything less is just smoke. So Aldo Leopold, for a lot of folks in conservation, know he was. He was a conservation hero in the early 1900s. And he saw the American West, West transform um, from wilderness to, to manicured. Uh, with keen insight derived from his own life's experience out West, he defined the true essence of sustainability to me, someone who's lived in the frontier and seen millions of acres transform into smoke uh, for no other reason, and that's just the status quo. All the sustainability criteria are important, but the least common denominator is always nature. Whether it be trying to figure out how to reclaim a degraded landscape in North America or how to prevent ex excesses in development of a new ag frontier in South America, that is where sustainability starts. So Aldo's prophecy is staring us in the face. The question to me is, will GRSB take it seriously?